hard, really hard to get your hands on, but the stuff is phenomenal. You just pop that into each frame that you built, hang them all over the place, bought some carpets, went to my old mentors and guys I used to work for and got keys to their storage and went in and raided them for producer's desks and console desks and a shitty old Control 24 they didn't want anymore. It's only worth about three or four grand anyway. A couple uh, pair of Soda 750 speakers, which are a company called State of the Art. It was run by Claude Fortier in Canada, which is probably the best speakers company to come out of, uh, out of our country ever. Um, those are like big boy main monitors. And then I got Ikea, you know like the Ikea bookshelves that everybody puts their records in? I got two of those and stood those up and I put these huge fucking mains on top of the bookshelves in each corner of the room. And uh, yeah, hung some panels from the ceiling, installed a ductless air conditioning unit. That was the most expensive thing. The only thing that cost money building that take care studio was the air conditioner. It was five grand to put a ductless AC unit in there. I was like, that was the worst. Because for me, I, I feel like I should be able to build a studio for an overhead of zero, you know? Maybe maybe five grand in total. But that, that air conditioning unit, I was like, ah. Oh. That's the one thing when you're building, like when you're building a makeshift studio, which I do all the time, it's my favorite thing to do, because you can recreate your atmosphere where you're working, you know? Um, a lot of things have to go your way, so. One thing you can't play with is air conditioning. You, know, you can't have a hot studio, rooms, everything. You know? The studio's cooking, can't work, you know? So um, your HVAC is really important. So it cost me money there. But here, building a studio at this place, everything worked out. You know, nothing went wrong. So. There happened to be like air conditioning in the washroom, which I turned into the booth. The only major construction I did in there, which was actually only took about an hour and a half, was just calling an electrician and a plumber to come and pop. Uh, the sink, the toilet, and like the vanity light fixture out of the uh, washroom. Again, I could have done it myself, but because this is like Drake's house and not mine, and I'm not actually a plumber or an electrician, it's probably just easier for me to, you know, call the guys over to do it in an hour. You know? It doesn't cost anything anyway. But if I was at home, I would have done it myself. And in the first, the take care studio, I plumbed it all, I built the kitchen, I did all the electric. I laid all the floors, I did all the trim, drywall, paint, everything. The only thing I didn't do was drywall and, and, and tape and mud the ceiling because that shit's just a little crazy unless you're really good at that. And I actually had my brother-in-law who's a, a, a contractor come in and just sand, sand the, the drywall for me because after we mudded it, it was kind of, you know? But everything else was really good. Laying floors is fun, I love laying floors. It's better to do it yourself, you know? It's easier, you get everything you want done exactly how you want it. That's what I did in this place. So, almost there, one more so day. So, when did you start it? When did you, I mean, you built it pretty quickly, right? Yeah, we had a little interruption there, but this is the, this is the fourth day. Today would be the fourth day. Cool. Spent three days working there. that shit nobody this could be the old shit probably is guaranteed the new shit's not so bad you can touch the new shit this shit no one want to touch old shit how what do you mean the old insulation the pink stuff oh right it gets really itchy you know but the new stuff isn't so bad. You can touch the new shit. 
You can work with it, you know? Your hands will be okay. Wash your hands. This shit is like on fire. Oh, I see the light. Woo! What are you doing now? I'm punching a hole between my new mic booth and the control room so I can wire this snake right here. With all my inputs and outputs. And yeah, had to pop through some drywall, a little bit of plywood, some bamboo wallpaper, some insulation. You know, made sure I wasn't gonna tear up any power cables. We're good, we did it, we made it. So what you got going here, you got a mic booth separation and... Yeah, this used to be the washer, so this used to be the toilet right here. So I just popped the toilet. The guy tried to tell me he needed to cap it and spend more money putting brick there, but I said no thank you, because I'm putting my master throne on top of it. And uh... What do you mean your master's throne? This chair right here. It's like, it's like the king's throne, you know? It kind of feels like, so it goes back here. You know, a little plaque. You got your little lights here, you can dim it out. You got some power, plug in your phones. In case you need to take a call, you know. Ready to go. So yeah, so that's done. You know, I need to push all this shit through there, but I need to tape it up first so it doesn't get too messy with all the fucking insulation. Duct tape though, where's the duct tape? See, these are my curtains that I built. They're kind of, you know, makeshift, but they definitely do the job. They I can well. open a couple now just for some light now. Yeah, for sure. You can hit the lights on too if you want. Oh, I think this, this will be tons. Yeah, that's good. Cool. I don't want to lose the tiger either. Yeah, that was here from the original room. It's an animal kingdom. Yeah, it was the safari room, you know? Yeah. So I felt like the lion and the tiger would remain appropriate. Just throwing in some duct tape to make a little a path through there for the cables to run. So you like building your own studio? I build them all. Every time. In Toronto I'm building a real place though, like a multi-million dollar place right now. This place is, you know, a few grand. Do I want to pull these six? So that's one through six. That's it, really, right? So it lets you know everything that's going on, right? If you're building it. Is that the point? Hmm. I mean, a lot of guys just have other people do this shit. No? Oh, yeah, of course. Well, no, like, I don't know. Okay, you, you talked to the guy who, like, went to school and they told me that I couldn't mix and produce. You know, they were like, pick one. You know, I was like, no, fuck you, I'm gonna do both. I'm gonna do both. But when it comes to making a studio, it's sort of like, I want, I have to trust somebody else to do this? How I want it done? Like, no way. Forget that. I'm just gonna do the shit how it's supposed to be done, you know? I don't really want to trust anybody. That's sort of how I've always been with my music, and when it comes to this stuff, it's all connected, and creating the environment where you work in is one of the most important things. So I like to create that environment every time. I really like the other studio I had in the other room too. Kind of sad to see that one go, but this one, this room's bigger.
Tell me about the uh, tell me about that first studio you built when you guys did the uh, was it the mixtapes that you did that studio in or what? Well, what's I, the history there? Okay, like I'm the history is more so like has to do with technology, you know. Like for instance, I'm 29, right? So when I was say 22 years old, when I was really like first getting into the world of like you know audio engineering and mixing and being around studios and so on above and beyond just being like a dream um i was mixing inside the box which means i was working inside of a laptop and not with a big console and desk and so on and so forth and i was working with a guy named gadget who was doing that in nuendo and mixing big records in the box and no one no one did that you know i remember in 2004 being in Sony music which no longer exists with my friend Omen who's a producer. He was actually working on Jay Mills's album, which is crazy. Because I know Mills really well now. Millsy. And uh people were looking at me like, man, is that Pro Tools on your laptop? Like is that is that I is that a I had a MIDI controller plugged into my laptop with Pro Tools and people were losing their minds. Like they just didn't understand how that was even possible, you know? So for me, I grew up in a world where the technology had just shifted when I stepped into the business. So I knew no different, you know? That's what I knew. So for me and Drake, it's like we're cutting rooms in my bedroom, in hallways, in living rooms, like it doesn't matter, you know? Cutting tracks. Whatever, yeah. We're setting up a mic and we're recording on my laptop. That's it, and that's always how we worked. You know, we did all this, you know, Best Ever Has one of Drake's biggest hits, you know? You know, we mix and master that in, 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 in our little apartment in Toronto, you know? So that's always been our, our the way we work. And so I just, why change it, you know? Now I just like build like bigger, more fun places. But even when we're on the road, you know, I'll clip some pillows to a hanger and stick it on a wall somewhere and call it a day, you know? Throw up some curtains and whatever you gotta do. Yeah, but there's something about that, no? It's something about being able to just get it on your own, how you get it, and not... I mean, you've avoided the whole big studio pressure bullshit, no? Well, you you save the money, you know? And it's like, when you're spending that type of dough, it's not even about the cash, you know? It's like, Lord knows Drake can afford it. But it's about the pressure for that shit, no? Doesn't it create a pressure? Yeah, it's like, oh my god, I'm spending all this money, I should probably do something. Exactly. Yeah, this is just like, hey, let's hang out at your house, or like at the crib. It's vibe, you know? It's way better like this, for sure, without any question. Perfect. Is that it? That done? Almost. A little cleanups in line. Replug in this snake, wire it to the, under the console quick. That's a wrap. But yeah, she's done. Is the mixer important to you? Does it matter? Depends. Because you were just saying, you know, you mentioned out there any type, you know, you got any kind of mixer in that first, I mean, does that stuff? Mixers? Okay, well like... Like, no, no, but the console. Okay, we, okay, so the console. We have to understand like under, under what context you're talking about. Like, uh, for instance, there's two types of consoles. Like, you know, there's digital, there's analog, and then on top of that, there's, you know, Ethernet controllers, which is like what I was talking about outside, which is a Control 24. All is a big mouse, you know? It doesn't do anything. There's no components, there's no tube. There's a little teeny 8-track mixer, which I actually use. And the pre's on that are actually pretty good. They're all focus right pre's. But regardless, that thing's just sort of a big Ethernet controller, you know? It doesn't do MIDI controller, it doesn't do too much. Right. Just instead of using the mouse, you can press the buttons. Right. You don't even want to talk about an SSL, a Neve desk, you know? Yeah, well that, it's a different what, story. That's uh, what, what we're talking about recording I mean, I, on Drake's like the front end of my recording rig, no matter what, like yeah, I'm using a Neve 1073 mic pre. So that's coming right out of a Neve desk, you know? Whether it be an 81 or a 73 or whatever it is, I'm pulling it out of a Neve desk. So that component is still there on an analog side and the beginning of Drake's chain. And whether it's a C800G microphone or it's a U87 or 67 or 47, it's, you know, 
there's that component on as far as his mic pre is concerned, and even possibly his compressor, whether it be a LA2 or whatever we decide to go with that day. What's your vibe on his? What's his? What's your favorite mic for, with his voice? What's? I just use an 87. It's easy, man. You know, it's everywhere. It's clean. It's consistent. There's nothing wrong with it. If I want a little more clarity in top end, I'll go to a C800G, and I'll go there when he's singing. You know, like for instance, Marvin's room was a C800. Uh, but for m majority of the time when he's rapping, I put him on a you know a, a, on, a, on an U87 or a 67 or a 47 if it's there. But sometimes like you don't even want to go there if it's a really old mic or this or that or even introduce that into a potential issue. You just keep it nice and simple. Give me an 87. Give me a 1073. Give me an LA2A. And if it's an old LA2A, tell me because if it starts crackling, I want to know that I can isolate that issue immediately. So my thing when I've been in studios has been everyone's always fallen to the ribbon as the voice, the ultimate voice mic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. But it depends like what your application is always. Sure. It always depends on your application. <clears throat> so it's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's nice to go there, but you know, this is rap too, man. Like people are yelling in the microphone at close proximity and you're talking about the guys who like, you know, cup their microphones on stage and you have to like explain to them why that eliminates your bottom end and actually doesn't help you but makes it worse, you know? Um, so you want to be prepared to sort of like handle any dynamics they throw at you. So sticking a ribbon mic out there at times could be very dangerous. Picks up too much. You're recording Celine Dion, Mariah Carey. I mean, sure, we can talk about other things, you know? Someone who's going to work a microphone in such high regard and, and, and treats their craft that way. Not to say that Drake doesn't. He's actually, as far as rappers are concerned, uh, you know, um, along the lines of Jay-Z and how seriously he takes his craft uh, and how professional he is with those type of things. But regardless, I'm just speaking of like, in general, of like a rapper on a ribbon microphone? I don't know, not up least. All right. We kill that, do you think? Just for a bit? Yep. It's like working on a car down here. These little blue lights down here too, see these? Disco. Yeah, little USB lights, they're sick LEDs. Okay, friend. There you are. Peace up. So did you have any idea that first mixtape what it would be? When you guys are working on it, what was your vibe on that? Hmm. Yes and no. Like for instance, the days leading up to us putting it out, we were getting like thousands and thousands of comments on our blog. You know, that's crazy. Now our blog gets like 50 comments on something. I'm talking thousands, like two, three thousand comments. Even on the biggest blogs, that's a lot. <laughs> right now, you know. So it was pretty evident that people were waiting for it. And that put a lot of pressure on us. But I definitely didn't know it was going to be as successful as it was. I knew there was a demand for it. You know? And I always knew Drake was special. I told people that Drake was the best rapper on the planet for a long time. You know? I was like, he's better than everybody. God bless Jay, but Drake's better than him too. Drake's the best, you know? He can perform better than them. He can rap better than them. He can write. He's intelligent, you know? So it plays all the, all the little parts very, very well. So I just, I knew he was gonna be successful. There's no doubt in my mind about that. 
but I didn't know so far God was gonna be received so well. I thought people were gonna think it was way more weird and slow and like tripped out and like depressing. That's like, well, obviously was like my main concern. So for people to turn around and be like, oh, it's unbelievable. It was like, whoa, 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 we're good. And then we still had best ever had on that, which was just like a, you know, a silly smash. So I kept all the haters quiet. It's funny what a hit will do for you, you know? So it's like. What do you mean it's funny what a hit will do for you? Like we're starting now. This is the beginning, I guess. We've been working a bit through the summer on the bus, you know? We got some great ideas. We have a great starting place. We got a good foundation of music. But like now we're getting, we're getting started, you know? We got a studio here. It's gonna be nice, ready by the end of the day. Shit. Oh shit, oh shit. Yeah, I need to get Orlex phone. This stuff was put up with some funky shit. Does that come down? This stuff? Did that come down in the night or what? Yeah. But it's cause uh, we ran out of Orlex phone cause yesterday was Labor Day. So I had to use like normal sticky tack shit that's like really not the business. Just to, like get it up. But uh, let's get the Orlex today and put it up proper. Cause they make some good adhesive. Yeah. I'm even like spraying this other adhesive that I have. It's so terrible. It's honestly like, it's, it's just awful. speakers get here tomorrow or Thursday actually. What are those? I bought a pair of KRA KR 402s. They're like they're like the bows of PA systems you know. They're like small and fucking powerful. So they come with like two big 21 inch subs and in the sub is a tower like this. So one big sub with a tower and then one big sub with a tower. So one goes there and one goes there, and I gotta get a shelf here. That's what's going against this back wall. You could throw a party with like 500 people, 2,000 people with those things. So like put them into this room, Whew. Yeah, when I was in the studio a long time ago with uh, this guy named Spec, he, uh, his producer came down and he had to bring in subs into the studio and hook them up because the studio he was working in didn't oh no, for it. sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. That's the move. How, do, how much do you deal with sub? Like, like what? I mean, I know you obviously deal with it, but how do you deal with the sub? You, you have those, like, just talk to me a bit about sub for a minute. Bottom end's like, you know, an interesting thing. A lot of people don't understand it necessarily. But, um,. two schools of thought, you know, there's like, there's people from like the old school, and like, not even from the old school, but there's like people who are just like stubborn, I guess, you know? Like, I'm not stubborn when it comes to that stuff, so it's like, oh, this room has shitty bottom end, I'll work around it, like, I know, there's always a way for me, you know? Like, it never, it never stops me, you know? There's always a way. Yeah, bring in a sub, fuck, go rent two subs, boom, done, you know? Throw them in the room, get a crossover, tune it yourself, you know? Every time I step into a studio, I retune it. First thing I'm doing, I'm like, I'm gonna look at the studio manager, like, yo, I'm fucking with your crossover. You know, like, where is it? Unless the room is proper. If the room's not right, I'm going to fix it. I'm like, fuck you, I'm not paying you, I'm out of here, you know? Also, if I can't smoke weed, I'm out of here too. Yeah, so I fix it. And then, like, in a situation like this, yeah, I got a sub under the table, you know? I keep it on a separate channel so I can control its level and I can create a relevant mix between my mains and, or my, my near fields and my sub. You know, I turn it on and off, I turn it up and down. I put it in, I put it out. But the thing is, my music has a lot of bottom end. I push a lot of bottom end. And Gadge, when he mixes for me, pushes stupid bottom end. So. You, you don't mix? You mix some, no? I mix, like, probably a large majority of Drake's music in his career. The only other person who's mixed Drake records besides me is Gadget. that's it. 
Nobody else has ever mixed a Drake record, just me and Gadge. If they have, it's a feature. Um, but actual Drake songs are only me and Gadge. And, uh, and Gadge is my mentor, you know, so he mixes for me. And uh, Why is he your mentor? Who is Gadge? I don't even know Gadge. Gadge taught me how to mix. And uh, took me on as an intern when I was a kid. And I, w I went to a school in Toronto called Trevis, and like really, you know, I went there because I knew Gadget was there and it helped create the curriculum. And Gadget was just this, like legendary Toronto hip hop. Like he was like the guy. He was the guy, you know. And whoever worked with Gadget just had you know the illest sounding shit. And he was like the mentor. He just taught everybody. He was the godfather, you know. And uh, so I went to that school and I just had the best marks. I was like killing the class because I'd been doing this for a long time. You know, so by the time I was 18 or 19 and going to school for it, I'd been doing it since I was 12 or 13. So these guys are trying to teach me about Pro Tools. I know more about it than they do already. And so that was kind of became evident. And they needed somebody who knew Pro Tools and I knew it like, like clearly more than anybody else. So they were like, hey, you want to go work for Gadget? And I was like, uh, yeah, I'm out of here. Whew, dropped out of school. I went and worked for Gadget. And I worked for him for about a year or two as like his like literally like sidekick bitch assistant. Um, and like put in some, you know, serious hours and stripes. <laughs> and uh, by the time that was done, I sort of just started doing my own thing for a couple years and just hustling around the city working, sort of when I connected with Drake and then we started running. As soon as I got myself into a position, I went right back to Gadget like, yo, I need your help, you know? I know you can help me mix these records and I've been trying to use all these big American guys, but you're, you know, no one's really giving us what we want. And I know you'll give me what I want because like I still model my style after you, so. Let's do it. So Gadget's yeah. been mixing a lot of stuff. You know, he mixed the motto, he mixed uh, Make Me Proud and this, that, and that. So off the last record, he mixed a lot of stuff. And he makes a bunch of, he makes four or five records on Thank You Later as well. But then everything else I mix. So it's a good balance between the two of us. Handle the smoke now. Hmm? So, do you handle the smoke now? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, no problem, dude. Tough ass. I'm a little excessive. No, I'm good. There you go, sir. Are those yours, dead ones? Yeah, dead. Back back on. Kind of got this deal figured out, which is good. The whole setup. Oh. 
Seems to be pretty efficient. Yep. One crew member. <laughs> Shops. Opening boxes is one of my favorite things to do. Usually I have a hard time waiting to get home. Some people shop for clothes and jewelry. I just want electronics and toys. When did you start with the electronics fixation? I was about six. When I was eight years old, I set up the networking and internet in my house. Of course, it was at a time when the internet was young, you know? The thought of an eight-year-old running the internet in someone's household now is pretty insane. So, you can imagine I was watching lots of porn as a young kid. Yeah. Wow, bro. How funny is that? Hey, I was also programming, like I started with like programming DOS when I was probably about six or seven years old. My cousins were big computer nerds. 386s and 486s. So my first computer I got my hands on, I guess by the time I was about 10, was a Pentium, Pentium 70. 70 megahertz Pentium. That's fucking wild. With 100, 100 megabyte hard drive and a 200 megabyte hard drive. What did you like, well, I mean, what did you like about all the geeking out? Well, I always liked math. I never liked music, I never liked uh, English. I like things that made sense and weren't subjective. So there's an answer, it's yes or no, it's right or wrong, you know? It's not what you think, it's not what that teacher's interpretation of Shakespeare is, which might I add is usually wrong. And I'm pretty in a, in a place to speak about things like that. But anyway, it's, uh, you know, it's just straightforward and to the point. And there's something like gratifying about making all this shit work. And I was always really into like, you know, electronics and engineering, like literal electro, uh, electric engineering. Uh, physics and mathematics and this is an application of that stuff you know this is a way for me to see all those things that I actually enjoyed come to life so as a kid I was like you know fixing the VCR and any any anything to do with anything that had a power cable was pretty much my domain in my house so <clears throat> so science is more the thing 100% Would you say that you believe in something that can't be proven or only the things that can be proven? Both. I don't, I'm not like diehard scientist in the sense of like I need that proof before I can believe something, but in the sense of like, I want it to make sense. Like, so, okay, so if you don't have proof, fine, show me a logical outcome, you know? Show me what your anticipation is or your projection is and why, and give me an educated, educated guess, you know, that I can logically, you know, make sense of. Would you say you're someone okay. who would, do you like? Would you say you're someone who trusts his gut or prefers to have something proven? Both. My mother makes me trust my gut. My father makes me a realist. I want facts and answers, you know. But you had to follow your gut a little bit for this whole thing. This is what, like, where I am now with this music career. For everything. Like building the studio. <laughs> yeah, the gut for the studio. No, but for everything. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And that's my mother, you know? Like, she inspired me to be that way, to believe in yourself. And as cliche as that sounds, it's some real shit. And to, uh, you know, be able to put something out in the universe. You just always say, if you put it in, out into the universe, it'll, it'll happen, you know? But you have to put it out into the universe. So I put it out there, you know? I willed it to happen. I've always been that way. But then at the same time, like, I'm not naive. I willed it to happen, but like, I knew Drake was good enough for it to happen, you know? So it's like, there's two sides to that. What do you think with Drake, what do you think it more is? Do you think it's more gut, or what do you think he's... I don't think Drake was a gut feeling for me. I believed in him, you know? I thoroughly thought he was that good. I thoroughly thought there wasn't anybody as good as him. 
You know but, what I mean? But as a friend, you've been a friend with him for a while, right? Right. What do you think his vibe is? Do you think his vibe is gut, or do you think it's proof, or what? Oh, you... him. Um. Gut. Yeah. Seventy-two, eighty, two chairs, two coffee tables. Right. Two chairs, one couch, one coffee table. Yeah, the seventy-two, eighty. You said two coffee tables. You want one coffee table? One coffee table. All right. One coffee table right here, two chairs, coach. Bye. Drake goes off his gut. For sure. How do you think you, you guys, you two, complement each other? I would say just that. He goes off his gut and I'm the realist. You know? Has it ever made you nervous when you've had to kind of follow the gut thing, or you know, like you were talking about yeah, the early mixtapes? Yeah, hundred percent. Hundred percent. In the beginning, when Drake was renting that fucking whatever it was, the uh, he was renting a Phantom, a Rolls Royce Phantom. We didn't have any fucking money, man. I was borrowing money off the street that time, you know. So to watch him like blow that type of money, renting a Phantom every month, holy! I was cussing the shit out of him. I said, Dude, what the fuck are you doing? Be rapped about that shit, you know? Counts in the minus, still I roll around the city like I'm fucking highness, you know? Or talking about on Sofa Guy, talking about parking the Phantom outside his mother's house and her telling him to park it a few doors down because it's so fucking embarrassing, you know? Because the neighborhood probably like had an idea of what their financial situation was and what him and his mother were going through, you know? Especially with Drake being a single, a single child, you know? And uh, to have him park in that car out there was some pretty ignorant shit, you know? So like for me to be who I was on my side of like our balance, that put me in a very different place. Like, what are you doing? When he bought his first big condo in Toronto, I walked in there like with a sour look on my face. Like, how dare you? What, what are you thinking? This is so elaborate. Like, why would you do that? You know, you got to think and be conscious about how you're spending your money and how you're moving forward. We have a long life to live, you know? But of course, these are all things that he did, which enabled us to get to where we are. And decisions he made that I might've been uncomfortable with that enabled us to get to where we are. So it's very important. It's been a very important part of his story. It's who he is, you know? And it's gotten us a very long way. So it's a, it was an important dynamic that he brought to the table. And then I always bring that conscious side to him, you know? Make sure he's thinking clearly about everything. Which of course, I think is important. So how do you go about starting with a track? Do you start with the beat? Do you, I mean, does he come to you with listen lyrics? I mean, you guys Every been... single possible way you could ever dream or imagine of happens. Everything, give me a scenario, what's happened? Someone else comes with a track, I come with a track, Drake comes with a track, it starts with lyric, it starts with vocal, it starts with melody, it starts with beat, it starts with chords, it starts with whatever you can think of. It starts with a cadence, it starts with a feel, an idea, a time, uh, anything. Like, it'll start from literally anywhere. I love when people ask that question, because that's always my answer. Because the truest thing, you know? It's like, it, it, every single way. It's never the same. What's my favorite way to start a track? That's different. And I think Drake would agree with me. In the sense of it's just usually when the two of us are just in a good place and nothing's bothering us and no one's popping up asking for anything. And we get to just sit in the studio and be like, hey, what do we do tonight? I don't know. Do you have to do anything for anybody? No. Do you need to do anything? No. All right. You want to make a new song? OK. You want to make a beat? OK. I start making a beat. Do you okay. guys ever get the party going? Because I, you know, I was in the studio once with, a, with one, uh, uh, who was it? Detail. Do you know Detail? Yep. 
They got. I mean, they had a they had a, a whole party going on when they were getting the track going. Did you ever? Do you ever do that vibe or? Is Absolutely it, not. I don't want anybody there. I make yeah, so all tell, my music. Just tell me your approach. Is like I make all my music by myself. You know, I don't need anybody. I don't need a mixer. I don't need an engineer. I don't need an assistant. I don't need fucking runners. I don't need nothing. I get my own coffee. I set my own mics. I fucking do all my own shit. I don't need anybody. So for me in the studio, that enables Drake and me to have a thing where we can lock everybody out. Not a lot of people have that option. They need five people. They need three people. They need someone to handle this shit. You know, we don't need that. So for us, our most comfortable spot is when Drake comes to the studio, he comes dolo. He doesn't come with a lot of people. You know? There's time and place for everything. Yeah, we got a session in LA. We ain't been here for a while and we're in a big studio and the whole world pops up. You know, sure. But for the most part, definitely not. It's a, it's a it's a very quiet environment. I'm like a militant. I'm like the nicest guy. Nicest guy in the world. Super polite, honest, all of that. But man, you're in my studio and you're not supposed to be there. I feel like you're gonna threaten our environment. I'll be like, I'm sorry, you, 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 out. Now, go, run, hurry, get the fuck out, you know? No patience for that shit. And you have to be because that's like a very, very sacred place, you know? That must be protected for me. So. I try not to let people get in the way in the studio. A lot of conversations been happening. A lot of people just want to hang out, you know? Yeah, it's it's the art of it. And it's it's like, when the art of it goes down, there's usually an, an incredible delicacy that can get easily offset by any kind of stupid things people just aren't even aware of. It's like it's like when you're acting and you're in a role because you said you act, you know. Yeah. You know you're in a role, you're on the set, you're concentrating on your character, and uh, and someone will say, you know, oh that guy's you know not being very responsive to me. That's because they're, you know, they're in they're in their thing. You know, they're what I mean? in deep train of thought. You know, and also it's like. For me, when it comes to say writing lyrics, like it's a very personal thing, you know, to be able to. And I don't never write lyrics. Like, I hate contributing to any sort of lyric, but like, because it's so personal. It's like for me to be like, "Yo, what about this? Like, what if you say this?" And then everyone in the room's like, "That's a stupid fucking idea. Like, that's dumb. You know, like, are you stupid? What the fuck's wrong with you? Like, not to say that my friends are like rude, but it's like, it's, it's, I just you never know. You know, if I say some wild outlandish shit, I'm not comfortable enough to say that type of stuff in front of people. You know? And the same goes for music. If I have a room full of 10 people, I'm gonna play different things. I have to feel that comfortable that nobody's judging me right now. You know, I'm not to be judged right now because I know people are watching, but at the same time, my process might take some time to get there. I might have to do a bunch of weird shit before I figure out something cool, you know? So I just want privacy to, to find that place on my own. It makes you less self-conscious if you don't have more people around. Mm-hmm. 100% very self-conscious about playing people music anything you know but that I guess is how I got to where I am you know by being very very uh, being very um, much of a perfectionist like I'm never happy I'm never satisfied I always feel like you can be better so if somebody's listening I'm like whoa don't listen no it's not done it's not done it's gonna be way better don't listen now you know so when I'm creating shit I'm damn well not gonna be there unless you're like a very good friend of mine or somebody very personal to me you know not to say that I can't be a professional and create in front of a stadium of 50,000 people. I mean, fuck, if I have to do it, I'll do it. But if you're asking me what I prefer, you know, or what makes me comfortable. Well, I'm asking more about the creative process because, you know, we're going to get into that as we go along with this this film. And you're going to see that. He's going to come by himself. You know, he'll come with security. That's it. They'll sit outside. I always tell the assistants, hey, thanks for setting up the room. You can wait outside. Peace, you know. Make sure nobody's in there. Yeah, that's how, you know, where he's going to find his comfort zone, where I'm going to find my comfort zone.
Oh yes, perfect. Whew. As long as this fits, I'm happy. What is it? It's the speaker mounts. So I can mount these things. Oh, this probably all comes apart, doesn't it? Of course it does. Putting those speakers in the booth for drink. Oh, playback speakers. Yeah. So he doesn't have to wear headphones? Precisely. Nice. He's still going to wear them, but just in case he decides, hey, can you play them without the phones for a sec, you know? After that guy in there. So what's your vibe on uh, incorporating live drums or that kind of thing? Is there, is there none of that? Do you do that? Do you? Oh yeah, for sure. Live drums are awesome. I just, uh, I'm not a drummer myself, and for the most part, I don't, you know, I don't have to pay for it. You know what I mean? Sort of like, if I have, I don't know. For me, it's like ah. I like making music anywhere, under any circumstance, on a plane, in the fucking backseat of a car, like it doesn't matter. So for me, it's sort of like, oh, I need, I'm not the one like, oh, I need a drummer, I need this, I need that, I just do it, you know, I just, I don't know, I just do it. I just use what I have. If a drummer's there, I'll use them, but usually won't call them, or like ask for any. Unless I'm doing that type of record that requires a live drummer. But if I'm doing that type of record that requires a live drummer, then like, I feel like I shouldn't be doing that record. You know what I mean? Not really. Like, okay, I don't like, okay, for instance, I've never used a live drummer, all right? I need my tracks. You wanna ask me what my inspirations are? I'm gonna tell you Van Morrison, Freddie Mercury, Queen, The Smiths, okay? That's what I'm gonna tell you my influences are. So it's not about the fact that I don't have a respect for it or understand it. It's about the fact that it's just not in my it's not in my catalog, so I'm not gonna, I guess I'm just not gonna reach for it. Like, I don't, I don't play the drums. And I, as I told you, like, I like being sort of self-sufficient, you know? I like making, like, everything sort of by myself. And then if an artist comes to me, uh, you know, if like, say, I don't know, like, what I can think of, like, a, what type of artist would come to me where, like, I would have to need a live drummer. Like, I'd need a live drummer to be able to execute the production of the song. Now, as a good producer, I'll get a live drummer and I'll produce the fucking shit out of the record. But... That's not where I am right now. That's not the type of music I want to do. I don't want to put myself in a situation where I just can't sit down at five o'clock in the morning and make that shit. Because that's what I do right now. So if I put myself in a situation where I have to call 10 people into a studio and schedule a session, and it's professional, and I have to be there at seven o'clock, we have to get together, we have to make it all happen. It's like, ah, oh, there's too much going on. It's too much work. Music's more fun to me than work. As soon as it becomes any type of like effort or work, I'm out of there, fuck that. You know? It should, it should be easy. That's where you're gonna find your magic, you know? Otherwise you're just chasing shit. So not to say like that's a very like interesting perspective of using a live drummer. I'm just trying to explain like my reasoning. Of course I'll use a live drummer. Like are you kidding me? Like, but yeah, but it's just not on my priority you, list. That's you cool. don't you don't want something. It's obvious to me that you don't want something to hold you up in the process. Exactly, exactly. You know, and I just know I never found a drummer that I worked that closely with. I know lots of great drummers, you know, and, and the ones that we work with on tours and shows and went back in Wayne's days and. That's all there, but. I ask because I know Drake's a feral fan, and I know he was one of the guys to start doing that again to bring the drumming back, right? Of like, course. So that's why I'm asking about that. No, for sure, for sure, for sure. And really and truly, like, I should be. But in the sense of how you, I mean, I don't want to get into the specifics of how you build your beats, but what do you like in a beat? What do you, is it something, you know? Melody. Chords, changes. I listen to music and melody first before I do the rhythm. It really? defines me very differently from a lot of producers in rap music, you know? Because a lot of producers, like m the majority of producers in rap music, start with the drums, work based off the drums. Everything's about the drums, you know? Drums is like the least important thing for me. I'm more about the music and the feel, you know? I get to the drums later. So maybe that, maybe that has some merit into this response as well, you know? Yeah, I'll, I'll deal with that. Whatever. I'll get it done. What? Yeah. What up? Working away? What are you doing? Getting my 
speaker mounts ready? Ooh. Or took off. Oh my god. That is so funny. Oh, I'm on. I know. It's just funny. It really is. What is this, spray? You didn't use the stickies like last time? I don't know. What, they won't stick? The stickies. Like the 3M shit. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I'm doing it differently. How does this shit work? Oh, that's right there. I get it. But you got red too? That's sick. Sick. Okay, I'm gonna do that. I like that. Woo! Dude, you can make a belt out of this. What up, T? And I was like, I was gonna say, you know, it's more like, it feels to me more like, don't let anything get in the way of us getting something down with the feel that we have, you know what I mean? Like not, because the more personalities you get involved in the mix, the more time it takes, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, really that's what it all sort of boils down to. We just have such like a painless, easy process that we very much love, you know? And you must have developed a language between you two after all these years. Yeah, at this point we don't even really talk, you know? It's like, we just go. Not a lot of, we don't need to talk a lot. Shit. And that's what's kind of surprising about, you know, some artists, especially when they get bigger, they switch from producer to producer, or, you know, they move around. Then they have to redo that whole language. They have to read, you know, or they don't even know what language they, they want, and that's the 100%. other thing. 100%. 100%. Yeah, Sick. All right, I got this. It's go time. So what'd you do? Oh, the phone. No, I put the, uh, I mounted the mic off the wall and the pop screen and I put up the speakers. Nice job. I scrapped the, uh, mic stand. You need more space, you know? You can reach underneath it and stuff. When you're holding the lyrics or you're reading off paper, you can hold it like right underneath. You can boom stand, but it's just cleaner. Comes right off the wall. So he's gonna see you on the screen, right? No, that's just for like TV or whatever the hell's on DVD player. And that's, uh, we don't wanna look at each other. And that's the uh, speakers, just so I can give him some playback. There's a sub down there. I can't see that one. Little oh, like yeah. stereo speakers I found in the house. Stick just up, close you know? this guy just for a second, then yeah, I can get a yeah. beautiful shot of it. Classy. That's so neat. That's so tidy. I like being tidy and neat.
Gotta go find another sub to wire to because that one's no good. Just found out unfortunately. And clean up and foam. Foam, 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 more foam. Yeah, they took it out of the car. Yeah, I took it out, just left it on the side there. Oh, yeah. Hopefully they didn't drive over it. Happy? Almost. I'm not happy yet. Not till it's done. I gotta go find a sub. There's a bunch in the house. That one, I wired this whole thing in and plug it in and I did fucking power on. Silly, silly. It was broken. That's what happens. You try to push it out of the garbage and make it work, you know? That's how I like to do it. That's how I like to do it. Something out of nothing. You know, like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, you know? Bridge. Like, you're talking about him playing with those elements and like almost producing those elements or almost playing those elements, if you will, in a different way than most people would anticipate, right? Using that as an extra tool, post a melody and all this, well, but arrangement. Arrangement is a clear tool, but I guess pushing the boundaries of arrangement. I mean, we push the, we push the shit out of the boundaries of arrangement, you know, <laughs> with Drake. And we push them as far as we can push every single possible way, but. And what about what about this? But when new it comes stuff? to making a hit, yeah. You want to talk about Drake's hits? Nah, the arrangement is clear cut. It's thought out. It's intelligent. But the thing is that the genius in this is in the simplicity. You know, to do it that simply, to like have it that easy, if you will. Like, oh, obviously they did that. Well, yeah, we did that because it worked. Because it made sense. If you're forcing those things, then it's not. That's not the genius of it. The genius of it is to satisfy all those answers because you wanted to. Because that's what made sense for your integrity of your product as well as for the answer as far as like the pop integrity of it. Like the how well it work a radio, is it, how long is it, you know, uh, is it boring, is it redundant, you know, is it fast, is it slow, like satisfy all those things because and have everything else work out just the way you wanted it to as well. That's the genius. That's a hit to me. Sure, if you want to have fun creatively, yeah, we push those boundaries and we'll do weird shit. That's not like necessarily a hit to me. You know what I mean? Well, how do you how do you think it might be a hit in people's minds? But when you say to me, "Hit," I'm in the record business. I'm not about hit. All right, that means that like you're making a shitload of money off it. That means it's raining publishing money. It means it has twenty thousand spins at radio. It's a hit to me. You know, people can be like, "Oh, I love that song. It's my favorite song." Great, love it. Thank you. What we're talking about is it a hit? If it's a hit. I want 20,000 spins. And to achieve that, I like playing within the rules, but for the right reasons, that's all. And what do you think on this new album? What, like, where do you think you guys will go as far as taking chances? Have you been talking about that or? Oh, Drake's the boundary pusher, are you kidding me? I gotta push any boundary you give up. That's what he wants to do. I'm the one who's like, whoa, come back, come back, come back. You know? Because I want to make sure people can understand how far he wants to go sometimes, you know? So on this album, it's again, it's getting it tighter. You know? It's exactly what I'm talking about, I guess. Smashes every time. But like, they feel good. And for the right reason, not forcing. We've forced smashes before. We've forced number one records before, you know? I don't, I, we definitely don't want to do that. What do you want to do? I mean, um, a combination of putting out records that we're confident that might go number one, like say for instance like a Marvin's Room, where it's like, man, we just put that out because we wanted to, because it was fun, because we enjoyed it, and it went number one. That's wicked, you know? But say that record like, Make Me Proud, that, that goes number one, but like, we knew it would. Do we feel good about that after though? Not really. You know what I mean? But then a record like, Headlines? Love that shit. Knew it was gonna go number one. So, those are good, you know? Records that we're confident that we know are gonna do well and move forward properly, and records that we're confident, like, really just musically, and we feel good about. We don't know how the world's gonna interpret, you know? But, like, God willing, they do in a good way, then so be it, it works out for us, I guess. Speaker wire. More speaker wire.
That's why you have extras. Shot, yeah.
Like the fact that you do that now is crazy. Oi, FFTV.